It's 11 o'clock, top of the hour. Let's uh, get started. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our hybrid session. My name is Jeff Wong from EXP Realty, your 2022 Education Committee Vice Chair. Some quick housekeeping tips before we get, get started. Virtual participants will be muted in the meeting, and we encourage all to please enter any questions you have into the chat box. The speaker will answer your questions during the Q&A toward the end. This session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, West San Gabriel Valley Realtors. Our co-host today is Jonathan, who will introduce our topic and guest speaker. And Jonathan, take it away. Hi, thank you, Jeff. Anyway, thank you. My name is uh, Jonathan. I'm with the First Team Real Estate in Diamond Bar. Uh, it is my honor to represent, um, uh, uh, I might pronounce your name incorrectly, Ami. Ami, so, I mean, that's right. Uh, Oh, thank you. Anyway, uh, it's, it is my pleasure because uh, I myself as a, a geologist, so I do know a little bit about environmental assessment as well. Um, it is a, a very interesting topic that a lot of people ask me and, and myself as well. So Ami is a very well-qualified um, uh, engineer as well. So he has a lot of experience and he's gonna share a lot of his experience and his, his knowledge with us today. Uh, Ami, please go ahead and start. Here we are evaluating environmental risk concerns, the phase one and phase two environmental site assessment uh, process. And uh, we have been doing it since uh, 1988. Uh, that's a long time. And uh, today we will answer several questions. Uh, phase one, environmental site assessment, what does it do even more important? What does it not do? And uh, phase two environmental site assessment, is it always necessary? And of course, the answer is sometimes it is and sometimes it is not. Uh, we will answer on this question. What is the cost of a phase two? How long does it take? We will respond to that. And contaminated property, is it the end of the deal? All right, that's... <laughs> This is one of the more uh, terrifying uh, questions that I get, I'm being faced with day in and day out. Is it the end of the deal? And the answer is definitely not. And we will demonstrate a few examples. Uh, do all contaminated properties require mediation? Uh, there is a difference between, re between remediation and mitigation. Remediation is when you clean it up, and this is a very costly. And mitigation is when you reduce it a little bit or defend against it, which is much more economical. So we will touch upon that too. And what does it take to remove environmental risk from the real estate transaction? We will touch on that. And uh, if you have questions, always call or text me, 323-899-5001, email amia at amiadini.com. And you will find that I'm always available to you. You can send me a report. I will analyze them for you. Uh, no charge. Uh, you can talk to me <laughs> forever. And uh, I don't charge for talking. I charge when I start actually uh, preparing reports. And, we, and I'm always, always happy to get you out of any misunderstanding or any confusion or any questions that you may have. So the, uh, our industry of the phase one and phase two uh, is majorly, majorly driven by the institutional lenders. Uh, first and foremost amongst them, the SBA, uh, Small Business Administration, uh, that stands behind uh, many, if not most, of the commercial loans being done today. And uh, because they stand behind, they issued their SOP, Standard Operating Procedure 5010, effective day January 2017, when they say, uh, when they guide the lending industry how to uh, defend against the risks that are involved in environmental contamination in the real estate transaction. The uh, SOP 50 uh, as a section says environmental policies and procedures. And they say these environmental policies and procedures apply to all lenders all lenders on all 7A loan programs, et cetera. Failure to comply with the provisions of this paragraph may result in a denial of SBA uh, guarantee to the lender. The uh, risk 
So the SOP is the standard operating procedure. Section B is the risk of environmental contamination include one, the cost of remediation could impair the borrower's ability to repay the loan and or continue to operate the business. So as a lender, of course, they want the borrower to be able to operate the business and pay back the loan, but the cost of remediation, uh, and I'll show you examples, sometimes could be so much that they uh, will make them unable to pay back the loan. The uh, value, and we say again, the SOP says, the value and marketability of the property could be diminished. If the borrower defaults, the lender or SBA might have to abandon the property to avoid liability or accept a reduced price for the property. And I show you the, the chagrin of this lady that uh, <laughs> probably works for the SBA or for a lender, or maybe she's the owner of the property and she's facing some uh, not very good consequences. The uh, lender, I said the lender or SBA could be liable. It's not only the uh, property owner, the lender or SBA could be liable for environmental cleanup cost and third party, dam third party damage claim arising from contamination if title to contaminated property is taken as a result of foreclosure proceedings and or lender or SBA exercises operational control of the property. So if they foreclose on the property, the SBA or the lender, if they foreclose on the contaminated property or take operational control, they can become liable for the problem. So uh, you can see why they would be very concerned about potential contamination. Uh, if, a government, if a governmental entity cleans a site, if this is all statements from this SOP, if a governmental entity cleans a site, it may be able to file a lien for recovery of its cost, which may be superior to SBA lien. So the SBA or the lender uh, puts a lien on the property to protect the loan, and then the property owner uh, defaults on cleaning up the property, the government moves in and they clean the site and they uh, post, uh, post uh, a lien on the property and their lien would be superior to the SBA lien. So you see why uh, SBA and lenders would be concerned about uh, dealing with contaminated properties. So let us see some uh, conceptual diagrams of contamination. So we understand a little bit better why the lenders uh, and the property owners, of course, are concerned. Here on the left side, you see an industrial plant and there is an underground tank and you see this purple thing coming down from the tank. We call it a plume, like a plume of feather, a plume. Plume is something that starts from a point and then it spreads out. So we have here a plume of contamination starting from the tank and going down into groundwater, which is colored in turquoise. And groundwater is not a lake and it's not a river. It's basically soil which is saturated with water. Like, in, like if you dig into the beach sand, you get into the aquifer, you get into groundwater. So you see here the plume, the purple plume going down to the groundwater. And because this substance is heavier than water, it goes down, 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 down to the bottom of the aquifer. And it's very difficult to clean up this kind of contamination. On the right side, you see Another plant, industrial plant, with above ground storage tanks, and they leak this uh, red colored thing, which is lighter than water. It could be gasoline or diesel or oil. Uh, it's lighter than water. It floats on the groundwater and then it evaporates and the vapors get into this uh, residential building and uh, the residents don't even know about it. Uh, here is another diagram of the same, uh, of similar stuff. Uh, you see here on the left side, there is a landfill and there is a plume of contamination going down and hitting groundwater, and it's also evaporating into the soil. So it, it spreads in the groundwater and goes up as a vapor, or it spreads in the soil as a vapor and enters into the building, so the basement, also the slabs, and the tenants or the residents of the building are now inhaling uh, toxic air. Uh, here is a, di a diagram of the EPA showing a situation uh, where you see, again, it's another picture. Uh, you see the uh, contamination in the groundwater. You see this uh, black uh, stuff down in groundwater evaporates into the soil and get into the building. 
And what we use in our, in our industry, we use the term or um, tool, which is called attenuation factor. Here you see on the left side, you see attenuation factor. Attenuation, when you attenuate something, you reduce the force of it. You reduce the thing, you reduce what it is. Uh, if there is a noise outside your home and you close the double pane windows and then the noise reduces, you have attenuated uh, the noise, all right? So this is what attenuation is. And when we have uh, toxic vapors in the soil, by the time they enter into the buildings above the soil, they're getting attenuated because the soil represents uh, resistance to the flow of the vapors. And the slabs of the building, uh, the floor slabs and the basement represent some resistance. So if we have, for in this example, if we have 1,000 units, here you see 1,000 units of toxic material, toxic vapor in the soil, by the time it gets into the building, it could be only 30. So what we use in our industry, we use attenuation factors because it is much more practical for us to go into the soil and test the soil for the vapors and see how much vapor is in the soil. It's more practical than going into a building and testing the indoor air. Of course, we do test indoor air, but testing the soil is more practical. And uh, we test the soil and then we apply attenuation factors in accordance with the situation. We have attenuation factor, which is one of 1000. We have attenuation factor of 0 0.030. Another one is 0 0.050. The higher the attenuation factor that we use, the more we predict that vapors will enter into the buildings. And there are certain systems that enable us to uh, decide what attenuation factor uh, to, to employ. Uh, here is a case in point. Uh, our client owns this building here, the apartment building. And they did the phase one because they want to refinance. They did the phase one and the uh, consultant, not our company that did the phase one, has told them that there used to be, maybe still is, a dry cleaner here on the upper corner here. And the consultant of the phase one is concerned that this dry cleaner may have contaminated the soil and it went underground into this apartment building. So they retain us to do the phase two. They need to refinance a couple of million dollars and the, the lender demands, the requires that they do a, a phase two because the phase one represented the concern. So we move there to do the phase two. We poke holes around the building into the soil and we paint these pictures that you see here. You see this uh, underground cloud, like in yellow color. This is like a cloud which of the toxic vapor that spreads from the source point, the plume goes spreads out and under this building and we tell our client, no, well, listen, uh, Mr. So-and-so, you have this toxic vapor under your building. This is the bad news. The good news is that the amount of the vapor, the, the concentration is so low that you don't have to worry about it. Uh, we give them a clean bill of health. They take our report to the bank and uh, they get the loan. Uh, here is another case uh, we get a call in the late at night, usually they call us late at night, you know, from a developer. And they want, they are interested in this uh, apartment complex here. And they give us the report uh, and everything is measured. Everything is known about it. And there is this toxic plume that started from the left another dry cleaner moved under the building. And they say to me, Ami, uh, tell us what is the situation? And I tell them, well, the situation is that you have a toxic plume under your building. And the concentration is as such that you need to protect, you need to defend the tenants of the building. It's a little bit too high. You need to do something about it. And they say, how much? And I say to them, well, uh, probably plug into your equation $400,000. So now they have a number. I don't charge them for that uh, consultation. And uh, you or listeners always welcome to send me your reports and I will tell you what they mean and uh, we'll give you approximate value. So in this case, I tell them it's approximately 400,000 and, the, and the, the solution is just do to the building what we do uh, to protect the building all across the, uh, Los Angeles from toxic vapor. Uh, uh, here you have a picture of a building. Uh, this diagram is taken from Los Angeles City Public Works and City or County, not the county. County of Los Angeles Public Works. It's a schematic diagram. Uh, you want to protect the building from entry of uh, intrusion of methane. So you put those pipes under the slab and you connect those pipes schematically here to uh, 
vertical vent goes out and uh, all the methane, uh, this methane is toxic gas, it explodes if it gets into the building. All this methane goes from under the building into the vent and out. And this is where you can do it under the building. Sometimes you cannot do it under the building. So you do it, uh, so you, put, you put those vertical wells, you see on the left side, vertical well, vertical pipes. So perforated pipes, you put them around the building and you connect them with the pipe uh, to a suction system and you suck it out. And uh, so this is the concept that this concept is being done all over the county, all over the city for, to protect against methane. And it is a good concept to do to protect against uh, toxic vapors. And we told our uh, developer 400,000, this is your number. Uh, here is a case, actual case in point uh, that we dealt with. Uh, uh, you see the building here in the middle and our client is very interested in this building. They want it, except uh, you see the cloud underneath, the yellow cloud of toxic vapors. Uh, it's in the neighborhood. It originates from the property down below, down south, where it says a source. They are the originators, they are the contaminators, and they created this toxic plume of gas that is spreading in the soil. But our client is not the source, is, is not the culprit, so to say. They did not cause it, but they want the building. They want to use the building. So we tell them, here is what you do. And uh, they purchase the building and uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so I'll show you in a moment later what they did. But this, in this case, uh, this is again uh, a case of toxic vapor under the building. All right. A uh, couple of pictures later, I'll show you what we did for them. Uh, here is a case of uh, another dry cleaner. Our client is here, uh, this uh, plaza, and. Uh, Okay, uh, they are in this plaza and they uh, needed to refinance. It's about, I think it's a several million dollar loan. And we have the uh, dry cleaner here, uh, kitty corner from them, and they contaminated groundwater. And groundwater is contaminated. It went from the dry cleaners under the street, under these properties that belong to our client. And uh, our client cannot get the loan because it's contaminated. So they retain us and we work a long time for, with them and with the regulatory agencies. And we prove beyond reasonable doubt that they are not the culprit. They are not contaminated. By the way, I use the word culprit easily because I don't consider dry cleaners to be culprits at all. They uh, have been using technologies for decades that were uh, acceptable uh, to the society and to everybody and uh, they operated in good faith. But it so happened that they contaminated unknowingly, they contaminated uh, the, uh, the soil. So uh, let's call them the source, not the culprit. So anyway, so the source is here on TV corner and they contaminated and our client, by the time they are done, they had to pay, they invested with us about $200,000 because it was connected with the regulatory agency, which was uh, very demanding. And we had to produce lots of reports, but eventually we proved them clean and they got the, the bill of health and they got the regulatory agency off their back. Uh, here is uh, another case of uh, uh, industrial plant uh, that we were retained to do a phase two there uh, to explore for contamination. And uh, we walked onto the property and we saw this uh, little uh, box here. Uh, there was a consultant previously that did the phase one, and they uh, did not really understand what this box meant. And they thought it was just connected to maybe to a sewer system, but it was not really what it was. Uh, this box had, but once we open it, and you see the connections here, uh, these were connections that led to an underground storage tank. So we, we, we were retained on the property to do a phase two, not to do a phase one. All that we had, we had a phase one report from another consultant that said, well, okay, there is a little vault, but it's nothing. Well, it was, it was something. We opened it, there was a tank under it. You see the connections to the tank. And uh, so uh, then we uh, went with uh, our uh, sub-consultant uh, that does uh, what we call it. A geophysical survey. Uh, we went there with all these electronic devices on the left side, 
and to explore for the tank to see how big it is. And we found out that this tank was about 4,000 gallon uh, tank buried in the ground that nobody knew about it. And uh, it was filled with water, 4,000 gallon of water filled. And uh, we emptied out the water here in the vacuum truck, emptied out of the water uh, because we wanted to remove the tank and uh, send the water to the recycler and got back and the recycler says, well, guess what? This water is laced with hexavalent chromium. Hexavalent chromium is a very toxic uh, substance. And so now we had a tank that the owner did not know about it and uh, a 4,000 gallon tank uh, with water, which are laced with hexavalent chromium, which is highly toxic and which we extracted from the tank. And now we, we move to remove the tank. So here is a tank in the excavation. Uh, we exposed it and uh, uh, I put my camera and my, and my eyesight to reach into this opening in the, in the, in the tank to, to watch, uh, to, to inspect, to look into the bottom of the tank. And what, I, what we see is you see this shining holes in the bottom of the tank. So this tank not only had 4,000 gallons of uh, highly contaminated water, we all, it also had these big holes in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the bottom. Here is a tank as we moved it and I put the little devil next to it and you see the big hole, this is the hole the size of your head. So, so we have this, a real estate transaction with a tank that nobody knew about it and the tank has these holes and it used to contain, we pumped out 4,000 gallons of water contaminated with hexavalent chromium. And uh, here is the excavation of the tank after we remove the tank. And you see it's a little bit wet here down here. And if this water, if this contaminated water went down to groundwater, which is about 30 feet down, we would have had a multi, multi million dollar cleanup on our hand. And, uh, but luckily um, there was clay here and the clay uh, plugged the hole and by the time we took the samples from the tank, here we excavated into the excavation. You see the back over here, we take, and you see the little jars, we take the samples, we put them into the jars. By the time we excavated and we removed everything, uh, what looked clean, and uh, the day was saved. I cannot say that we saved the day. Uh, the day was saved by the clay that stopped the leak, but had it not happened, uh, this would have been a multi-million dollar uh, uh, problem. So uh, back to the SBA, uh, so P50, and they say uh, they require environmental investigations. They say, okay, uh, how do we uh, avert the risk? Uh, SBA requires an environmental investigation of all commercial property upon which a security interest, such as a mortgage deed of trust or a leasehold deed of trust is offered as security for a loan or Debenture. Hmm. I don't know what debenture means. <laughs> Maybe you can help me. Debenture. Okay, security for a loan. All right. Uh, the type and depth of an environmental investigation to be performed varies with the risk of contamination. So they want uh, for any loan to be made, they want an environmental investigation to be done because they want to know if there is any risks. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we use, uh, we have a standard practice, how we do these investigations. And it is called the ASTM. ASTM stands for American Society for, for Testing and Material. It's a very um, I would say old, uh, many, many years, many decades, uh, maybe even more than 100 years of a society that creates a standard for the industry. And they are in conjunction with the Environmental Protection Agency, together created a standard practice for environmental site assessments, phase one environmental site assessment process. So the AST and the SBA and all the lenders today uh, demand that when we investigate a property for potential liability, we follow a certain practice. There is a standard practice, which is called the phase one environmental site assessment. This is dictated to us and it's a pretty comprehensive and pretty accurate uh, practice. And uh, what we look in this, in this practice, we look for the recognized environmental condition. This is a term uh, that the practice has invented uh, and it says, you, the consultant, when you do the investigation, 
tell me if there are recognized environmental conditions on the property. And in a simple language, in a lay person language, uh, when we find if we find hazardous substances of petro hazardous substances or petroleum products, if we find them on a the property, either if we see them or we think that they are there, we say we have a condition here. We look for presence or likely presence. Presence is actual presence. Likely presence, uh, the property looks very, very clean. I mean, we walk there, everything is uh, spitty clean, but we know something about the history of the property and we know that uh, 60 years ago, they used to have some tanks there and we said, hmm, no, right, the old tanks, they used to leak. So there is a likely presence of contamination and right away we assign a recognized environmental condition. Uh, we look for present, for past, present, or future releases. So we go, go into a property, we see some tanks, and say, hmm, these tanks, I think that they are not being handled right. They look to me very sloppy. I'm afraid that they will leak in the future. By the way, I declare a condition. And these, uh, we declare conditions that usually uh, present a threat to human health or the environment. Uh, last, but definitely not the least, when we see a case that generally would be the subject of enforcement action if brought to the attention of appropriate government agency, right away we declare a condition. Uh, and it happened more than once, many times, that, that I walk into a property or I inspect a property and I tell my client, look, you have some contamination or there are some concerns or there used to be a contamination here. And, uh, and even you have some contamination, it's not a big deal. Uh, you, you really don't have to do anything about it. And they say, well, okay, but uh, my lender, the bank or the SBA, because you said there is contamination here, even though you say it's not a big deal, they want me to get a clean bill of health from a government agency. So they want me to go to the, to the government and get them to write me a letter. You, you are me. Your letter, your words are not good enough for the bank. They want a letter from the government telling them that they will, it is okay. Well, in this case, if you go to the government, by the time they tell you what I'm telling you, you will have spent $200,000. And I have those things happening uh, every, every, I should say, every other week. Uh, because once you go to the government, uh, they, all, they will require uh, comprehensive investigations that at the end will tell you what my, uh, probably what my $20,000 investigation told you, you will have spent $200,000 and you will get the same answer. So this is uh, if your bank demands a letter from a regulatory agency, this is a risk that you are taking. And when I see this uh, potential condition, I declare it a condition. Uh, here is a picture, uh, we do a phase one, we walk into a property, it's, um, it's a uh, commercial street, uh, street plaza, uh, and we walk into the electrical room and there is this little this, uh, drum, 50 gallon drum, and it's corroded at the bottom and it's leaking and I, and I put my shoes into it and I couldn't put my shoes out because it's so sticky. And of course, this is an environmental condition, the thing is leaking. Uh, here is another case, which is a, a historic uh, gasoline station. Uh, we removed the tanks uh, in the early 1990s, long time ago, almost 30 years. And uh, it's in Santa Monica. This is Santa Monica Boulevard, and this is 17th Street corner. And uh, where you see the black patch, uh, this is where the tanks used to be, which we removed them, and now there are no tanks there. And, uh, uh, here is a diagram of the place, and here is the, what you saw, the black patch. This is where the tank used to be. And on the upper left corner, one, two, three, four, four, one, two, three, four tanks that we removed, and there was contamination there. Uh, here is a, a conceptual cross-section. You see on the left side the tank, and the tank has leaked and gone down, 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 and reached groundwater at about 100 feet. But the contamination was not that bad. Uh, we just excavated a little bit under the tank and Santa Monica, city of Santa Monica, the department, I forget what department it was there. Uh, they gave them a clean bill of health and say, okay, fine, you don't have to clean anymore. But we are familiar with this property and uh, we got a call from a prospective uh, uh, purchaser 
And we told him, look, we have a condition here. Yes, uh, the, the government gave us a clean bill of health, but if you are ever going to develop it and you are going to excavate there, you will encounter contaminated soil and you will have to take it away at a premium cost. So please know about it and please know that you have this uh, condition there. Uh, here is a school site in uh, Culver City. Uh, and just to demonstrate, uh, they started to develop it. They excavated and they encountered this contamination that nobody knew about it. So here is uh, we, uh, this is my superintendent. Uh, we came to the site, we are spraying the excavation with um, uh, something that quenches the, the vapors are coming out and we excavate to take the contamination out and the construction stops and it's costing money to everybody that the construction stops and everybody is waiting for us to remove this contamination. So this is a, a condition and uh, we call it environmental condition. Here is another case. Uh, it's a site in uh, Northern California, close to Oregon border. Uh, it's a redwood country. Uh, uh, our client owns this uh, red um, uh, uh, rectangle here. And uh, they want us to do, to investigate the property and we check on the history and we find out that there, all around here used to be a lumber plant and they, you, they would bring the lumber down the river down here and would treat it with uh, chemicals and those chemicals contaminated the water all the water that you see around here and the water is about five foot uh, deep and this is our client's property and without even doing any investigation we tell them right away look you are contaminated this is uh, this the entire area here uphill from your groundwater is contaminated it you are five feet above water for sure it moved under your property, you have a condition here. I don't even have to do a phase one to tell you that this is what the case is. Um, another client not far away from Beverly Hills where you see all these uh, black uh, spots here, the black little black spots. This is a Beverly Center of today. And the entire area used to be a very active oil field. So all the black uh, little circles are, are uh, oil wells that have been abandoned. Uh, but some of those wells are, are leaking, and some of them are leaking methane, some of them are leaking tar, and this is not far away from Labria tar pits. And our client owns this property here, which is in the yellow rectangle. And we know right away, we say, okay, you have a condition. You have here all these wells, and they are leaking. Uh, you have a condition. Um, the uh, phase one in, uh, inquiry has to be done by an environmental professional. The um, uh, EPA uh, and the ASTM uh, declare that it has to be done by a person who is an environmental professional. And there is a very detailed uh, definition of the EPA as to who or what are environmental professionals. It's about a two page long definition. I'm happy to tell you that I am a qualified environmental professional by the definition of the EPA. And environmental professionals should be responsible for doing this phase one uh, investigation. The component of the phase one, uh, there are interviews. Uh, nowadays, after the COVID pandemic, we used to do it uh, face to face, and, but we, now we prefer to do it by questionnaires. We send very detailed questionnaires uh, to the uh, uh, past or present owners, operators, occupants, uh, anybody that is connected in present time with the transaction, we send them questionnaires to, and we interview them about what they know, what knowledge they have about the property. And um, we send them a list of all these documents and we say, if you happen to have any of these documents, environmental audit reports, uh, data sheets, uh, geotechnical studies, it's a long list of about 25 documents. And we say to them, if you happen to have them, don't work too hard. I mean, don't go, I don't know, to the uh, uh, third down basement, but uh, if you know that you have them and they are handy to you, give them to us, okay? This is what we call, this is ascertainable, uh, practically available information. Give it to us, we will review them and we will, you don't even have to review them, just give it to us. So we ask for all these documents and some, we review federal, state and local government records, uh, like thousands of records. Um, and we go, we review records of the history of the property all the way to the time it was uh, first uh, uh, developed. And it could be sometime in the late 1800s. Uh, here is an aerial photography. 
uh, that we use. We, we get good aerial photographs all the way back to the 1920s, and we look into them to decipher, to find out the history of the property. Here are uh, topographic maps. We get good topographic maps to the late 1800s, so we look into them. And we look into city directories. City directories are an awesome source of information because they tell us names of businesses that used to be on the property and around the property. And by the name of the businesses, we can uh, guess who was there. Uh, <clears throat> for example, here is one such directory, 1957, run and tape shell service, uh, 1994, supreme alignment, uh, 2006, Lubing Super, whatever, Supreme Body, okay? Uh, so uh, the, uh, or Loop Inc. and Supreme Body. So, so you see the city directories give us pretty good information as to who was there. And uh, we look into maps of the property. This is a layout of the property. Uh, we look to see if they used to have septic tanks. Septic tanks are source of contamination in the old times when you were not connected uh, properties were not connected to the sewer, they would discharge uh, into a septic tank, which goes into a drain field. So whatever goes into the septic tank is going to a drain field and go from there to the soil and to the groundwater. So we looked into septic tanks. Um, I'm sorry, there's another layout. And then uh, we get what we call um, uh, a radius map. This radius map, is an electronic map that give us the results of electronic research of over 130 government databases. This is thousands and thousands sometimes of details uh, of, of sites that could be source of contamination to our property. Our property is here is in the bullseye of this uh, radius map. Uh, the, the, the green uh, triangle, the green rectangle, this is our property. All the, the red triangles uh, uh, here, up here, and all the uh, black squares down here are potential sources of contamination that could impact our property. And this is an electronic map, and I click on any of this triangle, and right away it opens, uh, it opens a window for me. So you see, here is a window, it right away a drop-down window, and then I and then it gives information, and I click on any of those uh, uh, blue uh, uh, letters or blue words here, okay, okay, uh, blue titles. I click on them, and right away it opens another file. And this way, uh, we uh, read uh, all of these sites that surround it and see how they could have impacted the property or the property itself. It's a very very comprehensive. Uh, 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 research and then we tabulate everything that we found, we tabulate it uh, in this table and we say what we found. And then we look and we ask uh, the purchaser and the buyer, I mean the, the purchaser and the seller, uh, what is the cost of the transaction? How much do you sell it? I mean, uh, does the property sell at a, at a price which is much lower than the market value? Because if they sell it at a price which is much lower than the market value, we ask them why? Maybe you sell it because it is contaminated. So we ask for the purchase price. And then we inspect the property and we look into every nook and cranny in the property uh, and surrounding properties. And we, uh, you see, there are we, hundreds of pictures. And eventually we produce a topographic map and we write our a report. Uh, so, this is our the product of the phase one, is the phase one environmental site assessment report. And um, uh, sometimes it can be like 1200, 1300, 1500 pages. And of course, uh, we don't inspect you as a client or you as a real estate brokers. Uh, we don't expect you to read uh, 1,200 pages. So we give you an executive summary and findings, opinions, conclusions. Our executive summary is usually two to three pages long. And we don't even expect you to read <laughs> the executive summary. Usually you go all the way back, all the way down to that's the conclusions and recommendations. Uh, but this is uh, sometimes the few lines at the end are the result of uh, easy, 50 hours of work and 1,200 of pages of information. And then we tell you if you have anything to worry about it, if you have recognized environmental conditions, and this is the phase one uh, report. And uh, if we have anything to worry about, then we move into the phase uh, two uh, uh, section, uh, phase two environmental site assessment. Is it always necessary? Well, if the phase one 
tell you that you've got a problem, then you as a buyer or as a seller uh, needs to decide if you want to do a phase two. And uh, the phase two is basically just a yes or no answer. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's a black and white type paradigm, okay? Uh, is it contaminated? Is it not contaminated? Phase two will not tell you uh, how big the contamination is, how much it is. Uh, is it yes or no? Is it contaminated? And we move with all of our uh, paraphernalia, all of our tools uh, to do this phase two. On the upper left side, you can see a drilling machine. We can drill down hundreds of feet with this drilling machine. Bottom left, you see us um, exploring for underground storage tanks. Um, middle, uh, bottom, uh, you see us inside an industrial plant drilling down 40 feet to groundwater to take some samples. Upper right, uh, here we are pulling uh, vapor samples from the soil, and bottom right, we are. I'm sorry, somebody's trying to call me, and I'm not going to take this call. All right, so, uh, and okay, so uh, bottom right, uh, you see us uh, uh, drilling by hand. All right, and uh, so here is uh, the maps of a phase two investigation to demonstrate what the phase two is. So on the right side, uh, it's a developer. Uh, they develop this uh, community of uh, townhouses. And uh, the concern was about lead in the soil because the property is very close to a freeway. Uh, and there was a concern that the, 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 the dirt may be contaminated with lead that historically was used in a gasoline and came out from the uh, tailpipe as fumes and would uh, and used to contaminated areas and next to freeways. So uh, we tested this entire property. Every red spot that you see is a sample that we took from the soil because it's residents and uh, residences and they are uh, uh, pretty uh, sensitive uh, to know if it is contaminated. And we took all these samples and we gave them a clean bill of health. Uh, they were very happy. So this is a phase two, it was a yes or no, it was the answer was clearly no, the property is not contaminated. On the, uh, on the left side, uh, you see on the left side, are you, uh, sorry, okay, on the left side, you see uh, another property that used to be um, an auto dealership. And uh, the phase one said that it used to be an auto dealership, there used to be a mechanic here, and they were concerned that the mechanic may have contaminated the subsurface. Uh, we moved in to do the phase two. Every star, every red star that you see is a point where we poked hole into the ground and we sucked out the vapor to find if there is contamination. And yes, we did find here in the, the middle two spots here, uh, in the middle two spots, we found some contamination and, uh, but we declared it uh, non-consequential. We said, yes, it is contaminated, but uh, it's not a problem, we are home free. So this is an example of, of, of a phase uh, two. Um, cost of the phase uh, one or phase two, cost of phase one process, um, you can get it anywhere from 1800 to 3000. Uh, these are kind of a, a little bit um, old prices. I would say today, is probably more in between the 2000 and the 3500. Uh, well, we got some inflation, this <laughs> the latest news. And, and these numbers are a little bit old. Uh, the phase two, it's okay, even today, it's about anywhere from 6,000 to uh, 20,000. Uh, time. Phase one report, we like to ask three weeks. Uh, we always are getting pressed for less than three weeks, but three weeks is the optimum because it takes time to get the report and all the records and, and analyze them. So give us three weeks. And then if you need the phase two, uh, give us another three weeks. And in between, leave time for negotiations because when we, when we do a phase one, if we come with some concerns, right away, buyer and seller, uh, they start negotiating. And then if we say maybe phase two takes them several weeks to decide if to do the phase two, then it takes another several weeks. So it's always um, good to do the phase one, even before you open, if you can, just before you open escrow. Because when you open escrow, you open it, I don't know, whatever, a week, two weeks, three weeks. Uh, this is very, very tight, okay? Very tight. So if you can do the phase one before you open escrow, especially if you are the owner or the seller, you may want to know 
uh, what you are selling before you sell it, as it would be my advice to you. Um, so, uh, yes, we have been doing it since 1988. And uh, let me see if you have any more. Uh, just if there are more. No, I think. Uh, okay, yeah. So, uh, this is it. So, uh, let us open the floor for questions, if there are any questions. Um, let me see on the chat questions. Yeah, we do have a question. Uh, okay. This question is very similar to the question I'm going to be asking you, though. The question uh, Joanne is asking is, what type of surrounding property usually bring concern to environmental concern that we need to be more cautious about it? The surrounding properties, whatever you, you look at right now, whatever you know right now is a picture of present time, okay? It's a current picture. So yes, I can look around and if you have a dry cleaner a next door, if you have a gasoline station next door, if you have an industrial plant next door, um, <clears throat> right away we will raise a, a, a concern. But in many times uh, the so-called the culprit is not what you see in present time, is what used to be there sometimes 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, but um, to repeat again the answer, surrounding properties. Again, I would say dry cleaner, gasoline station, industrial plants, uh, machine shops, uh, plating facilities. Uh, this type um, uh, would raise the right away an immediate concern. Uh, it says that who can you recommend for phase one and phase two environmental site, site assessment in Cleveland, Ohio, it was asked by Tom. Okay. Uh, I personally and my company, we don't operate in Cleveland, Ohio. However, mm -hmm. um, we can, uh, uh, if you retain somebody there, I can, I can help you retain somebody there. And uh, if it takes um, much time for me to interview them, I may charge you a little fee for that, but I can help you retain a local consultant there. And, uh, and you have already retained a local consultant, you have the phase one, then send it to me and I will be very happy to explain to you what they say and guide you if needed to do a phase two. And then if you move to a phase two, I will guide you uh, again, what scope of work, how to do it. And usually I will not even charge for that. I have a question from Joanna again. She's asking about what about restaurant in terms uh, no. of guests? Restaurant, I would not be concerned about it, no. Okay. Not at all. Well, uh, personally, I have a question. Uh, this is this happened quite a few years back. Uh, I did check one of the retail spaces that was once occupied by Dry Cleaner, but they have been vacating that place for at least, I would say, a few years. It has been vacant for a few years, but I can still smell the fume inside the Dry Cleaner, though. Okay. Is that something that we have to concern about, though? Uh, yes, uh, first of all, uh, your nose is already telling you some of the story yeah. and uh, we can smell parts per billion. Our nose can smell things that sometimes our most uh, uh, delicate instruments don't even sense. Uh, it's something. So uh, yes, the smell is an indication and the fact that they use the dry cleaners, what the solvents that they use, the dry cleaning solvents that they use are persistent in the environment. They don't um, disintegrate fast, they're very, very slowly. And they can stay in the soil, in the soil vapor, in groundwater. They can stay um, uh, 50 years, 70 years, 80 years. They stay a very, very long time. So uh, I would, yes, I would be concerned. So basically we have to be careful uh, in terms of we, we, we we own the rent uh, commercial property. It's be careful not to rent to dry cleaners, then, right? Uh, no, that's not right. No, no. Oh, okay. because uh, no, no, because uh, by by law and by regulations now, dry cleaners uh, cannot. Let's put it this way: if if they have machines that are still using the old uh, dry cleaning solvent that is toxic. Uh, they have a deadline to stop using it, I believe, next year, all right? And uh, since uh, 
probably more than 10 years ago, uh, any new dry cleaning had to use machines that don't use these carcinogenic these solvents. So uh, uh, modern day cleaners, if you want to rent it to a modern day cleaner, uh, you should not be concerned about it because they use uh, cleaning substances which are environmentally uh, not hazardous. Oh, okay. Uh, it, anybody else have any more questions? Well, if you don't have it now, they may have it in the future. Yeah, they always well, they always welcome uh, to call and uh, okay. and send send me reports and we can talk about it. Okay. Well, let me ask you something that is quite interesting. Though. I did see a couple of your slide back uh, before that. You know, some of the contaminants is from next door property. So, in that case, let's say for example, the next door is a gas station, and then it's sitting next to a apartment complex. Then the contaminant is not from. So you the, said the next door is gasoline station. Let's say the what? next door is a gas station. Okay. And then it's sit, and then the apartment is situated next to it. So the, then we know that the contaminant is not from the apartment complex. Okay. So why? So how are you going to get a, a clean bill for the lender? So. Got it. Uh, well, first of all, we need to see if this gasoline station contaminated the subsurface under your apartment building, number mm -hmm. one. Number two, we need to see if this uh, contamination uh, represents any hazard to the apartment building. This, these are the two conditions, all right? So uh, uh, if the contamination is there and it does not present any, any risk or any, any, any health problem, then nobody cares about it. So yes, they contaminated, but it's not a problem. And uh, if it is a problem, uh, then uh, you you have a neighbor that contaminated you, and you have to go up to the neighbor. Uh, but I would say, in the case of gasoline stations, usually uh, the problem is is uh, limited to the area which is very very close to the gasoline station. And usually it's very remote that they will, that the problem they created would endanger, would create a risk to a nearby apartment building. It's very, very, very remote. And then Jeff, I have a question. What is the most common environmental concern for residential though? Uh, if the property is residential and if it is in a residential neighborhood, then the most common concern is no concern. <laughs> having, said, having said that, um, you need to, to look around the property, take a certain radius and see if your property uh, is on the verge of um, a commercial street, all right? And sometimes it happened to us in the past that some commercial residential properties across the fence, across the property line was commercial strip. And the commercial strip has contaminated and the contamination moved under the residences. So if you are in the midst of, the, of a residential neighborhood and if uh, I would say uh, there is nothing behind the fence and there is nothing a hundred feet down and there is nothing 300 feet down, you probably have nothing to be worried about. Uh, in uh, about a year ago, I had a family that purchased a property in Palo Verdes. Now this was a very high end uh, property and uh, the um, lady and the mother of the, in the family, she had little children and she was very concerned about toxic vapors coming from a landfill. And I told them, look, this landfill is about a mile and a half to two mile away from you the chances are slim, but still she wanted to be sure beyond any possible whatever doubt. So we went there and we took the samples and of course they came clean. Uh, so, but I would say, uh, again, for most residences, uh, there is no concern. Well, actually good question from Jeff is because some of the old neighborhood that we have still locally here uh, has septic. Is septic a considered environmental concern? If this is a septic tank for a residential property, and it has always been a residential property, we are not concerned. Oh, okay. what, what, what happens sometimes in commercial properties, 
they are located on a property that used to be residential. And, uh, and the residential had a septic tank. So in this case, we may be concerned because it changed the use to, to commercial. Mm. And then we have a question from Greg. Uh, what are the sources of methane which sometimes show up in residential air with no obvious nearby source? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? The what are sources of methane which uh, sometimes show up in residential air with no obvious nearby source though? Got it. The source of methane is, uh, first off, if you are located above uh, an oil field, uh, oil generate methane. And if you are if if you are located in an area which is um, used to have a lot of um, oil wells in it, um, the oil wells that were built in the past are conduits. They become conduits to the methane which is coming from the ground and then it spreads all around uh, the wells. So th these are the sources, but this is more or less natural source that uh, was enhanced, if you wish, by, by human activity of drilling uh, for oil. Uh, but, but then again, um, there are ways to protect from methane. And uh, we have a, a whole neighborhoods of cities built upon met methane. Just go to a Playa Vista. The entire Playa Vista is built on a methane field. And it's a very uh, a flourishing and prospering uh, uh, neighborhood. This that that's a very good question and good answer though. Uh, I I sort of live in a city in Amoni that we used my street used to be the very last street that used uh, well water the whole entire street, and we were this is many many years ago. We were told at one time that we're not allowed to drink the water because the, there is a pollution in the water, and then the source is quite far away. So that's probably like ten miles away. So I know that it can, there's no obvious source nearby, but it can travel quite far, the contamination, is that correct? Yes, yes, the uh, San Gabriel Valley, the aquifer, uh, in San Gabriel Valley, the aquifers are contaminated with chlorinated solvents. It's a widespread uh, problem uh, about very, very large sections of the San Gabriel Valley. And, uh, the EPA has long since gave up on trying to uh, clean it up as a source. And what they did, the groundwater there in San Gabriel flowed underground uh, to the area which is called the Whittier Narrows, all right? Uh, where the uh, 605 freeway meets uh, the 10 freeway. This is Whittier Narrows. And it goes there and they put a plant there that sucks out, pump out the water and clean it up. Uh, but um, uh, yes, if you want to put a well yourself and drink the water, you better have some purification system at your place. If there's no more other questions, so I think Jeff will be closing. Yeah, thank you. On behalf of West San Gabriel Valley Realtors, we would like to thank Ami Adini for being our guest speaker and for your informative presentation today. We have an amazing lineup of useful and interesting upcoming classes tomorrow, July 20th, maximize your listing opportunities, learn to list and sell bankruptcy properties. On July 26th, we have broker symposium in the morning and on July 26th in the afternoon, we have the new RPA resident purchase agreement training. We hope to see you there. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much.